What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Prosper Show e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. They have an amazing conference with some of the top Amazon sellers and industry leaders like we have today, Devin. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service-based professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, coaches create additional revenue streams and stop just trading time for dollars. Uh, They hold you accountable to achieve your biggest goals with a step-by-step roadmap. Check out Rise25.com, run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. It's application only. Today, I'm excited. Uh, We are talking to Devin Johnson. He's founder of First Smile. They pick up hundreds of thousands of parcels all across the U.S. and internationally. Since they deliver direct direct to major shipping networks like UPS, FedEx, they can provide significant discounts. They've been named the fastest growing company in Utah. And within the first 12 months of business, they grew to a multi-million dollar company without investment or debt. And they have operations all over the U.S., United Kingdom, Italy, Hong Kong, many more. Um, They use a proprietary proprietary technology to help businesses connect manufacturing, warehousing, fulfillment, and shipping. Devin, hopefully I got that right. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. You know, shipping is a very small margin business. All Most of the logistics sector is. So when you're trying to feed a family off of, you know, three cents a package, it takes thousands just to, you know, get a kid's meal at McDonald's, you know. So, yeah. So ha- having had experience in kind of the door-to-door world and business. I sold door to door all over the country. I had a little wireless company that I would run it during the, uh, at nights. So during the daytime, when people at their office, I would knock doors and warehouse complexes and, you know, other, you know, business units. And then about five o'clock at night, as people were going home, I'd go to the gas station, get a monster energy drink and change my shirt. And then I'd go knock doors selling dish network and internet services door to door so I could feed the family you know, off of the money I made at nights. And then during the day, we, I worked on my shipping business. And so, you know, it's kind of funny because even then, that was like eight or nine years ago, but even today, uh, there's kind of some, some stuff that's come out of that, namely that my full name is Devin Clyde Johnson. And, and in the early days, I had to kind of like separate my worlds. So during the daytime, I would go by Clyde in, in the shipping <laughs> yeah. and at nights I was Devin. So, cause what was happening is I would be in someone's warehouse trying to set up their software and I'd get a phone call and someone would say, Hey, my internet's running slow. And, and I, that was a lower priority. So when, if they, if I answered the phone and they said, is Devin there? I would take a message and call him later. Likewise, if it was, you know, 10 o'clock at night and I was working on someone's internet speed and someone said, is Clyde there? I knew that something was going on and I needed to take the that's, calls. That's more pressing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's so funny because I'll be on a, even today. I'll be on a conference call, you know, uh, from someone he, you know, who the was the early customer. Yeah, and I, you know, how you call and you say, "Hey, Devin's here," you know, you know, we'll all check in, and then and, and someone inevitably will say, "Well, is Clyde getting on the call?" You know, so it's 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 kind of an inside joke for people that know us, you know. That goes back nine years. So you started the company nine years ago. Well, I got into the this industry about nine years ago. This company, First Mall, started in, in the spring, uh, April 2012. Okay. So it's a totally new business, but I kind of, I started selling shipping products door to door about nine years ago, yeah. So what were the shipping products uh, nine back, years ago? Yeah. Days, yeah. It was a very, very niche USPS product that was kind of, you know, there's kind of a frenzy over like these NSAs that that are just pretty much a commodity now. But uh, back then it was kind of this new thing. And so uh, my whole life was um, just understanding technology and figuring out why all these people had a shipping software called Dazzle. You know, I, I, it took me a while to figure out if it was Be Dazzled or Dazzle or, you know, what it was. But anyways, I, I definitely earned my stripes back then, you know. I want to go back, you know, to your mission days at some point. But 
But what works going door to door? Obviously, you are a seasoned, toughened, hardened door to door person because you've been doing it for years. What do you find? What tactics and things work well when you're actually uh, approaching that? You know what? You, what it really comes down to is being a workhorse, not a show horse. I mean, you can spend a lot of time reading, you know, we, we read a lot of sales books, and there's definitely some sales tactics that work and, you know, things like that. But by far, more than anything, being mm -hmm. a show horse uh, is, is not as important as being a workhorse. Because, you know, when you, you, you learn the jargon and you learn who to talk to and how to talk to them, you know, you, you just you learn that stuff over time. So just literally just knowing how to roll up your sleeves yeah. and just be consistently, you know, hunting. That's that's what it takes, really, to be yeah. honest. I mean, you know, when you when you approach a door, someone's immediate reaction is to not want to open the door for a solicitor or someone. So sure. do you have like a greeting that you find? people open up to or like what would you say to people in when you were nine years ago when you're going up to their door oh yeah sure i mean absolutely there's definitely some tactics in doing that but you know, to be honest it's just total transparency and a smile you know and and there's definitely a vibe that, that people carry when they're kind of going door to door and that i think that kind of can put people in a defensive posture so figuring out how to how to how to just step in the door in a way that doesn't put something in a defensive posture, right? So that could totally vary based on the industry that you're in. Yeah. You know, yeah. For me, probably one of the best things was, you know, I, I'm I'm a shipping guy, right? So I didn't I didn't want to talk to your accountant. I didn't need to talk to your HR person. Um, I didn't necessarily need to talk to your CEO. I I so. If I knew I was going to be in an area where there was maybe a, a customer that I really had my eye on or that I knew I was going to be approaching or if I knew an area I was going that day, I could look at the companies I was going to, I'd, I would get on LinkedIn or Facebook or I'd just Google your website mm. and I'd see if I could just find the name of a guy in shipping, right? So right. when I walk in, I had a friendly face and I asked for someone by name yeah. um, so that it didn't feel like I was in there just like looking for somebody to yeah. listen to me. I, I right. came up with the purpose of someone to talk to and... So that's that smart. Doing some research ahead of time instead of like, "Hey, can I talk to your shipping manager?" is a lot less personal. Like, "Hey, like, is Tom here from shipping?" Yeah, exactly. Yes. Because if I say, "Hey, is someone here from shipping?" the first thing they ask is, "Do you have an appointment?" Who are right? you? Yeah, get, say, hey, get is, out. Here, it's like, "Are you a buddy of his?" Yeah, sure. Let me grab him. You know? <laughs> I will be after five minutes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, so there's all sorts of little quirky things that I learned, you know, because I did door to door. If you had my mission days yeah. to traditional door to door, you know, I did it for almost 10 years. So, you know, I've knocked thousands, hundreds of thousands of doors probably all throughout America. So, you know, if you want to get yourself into some interesting situations, you just start, you just stop into a random neighborhood, some random city, and you just start knocking on doors and you'll, you'll get, you'll get some uh, pretty fun experiences. So, Devin, what's your craziest door-to-door -door story, even if it's part of your mission days? Oh, my gosh. I don't even know if I can talk about it. You know, you might have to censor this. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, I've been – I was chased off of a door one time with a guy who – a guy who is, I guess I'll say, large in stature. He was uh, very healthy, big guy. And uh, he chased me off the door with a shotgun one time. Really? Why? Just – Just he did Want someone on his door and he's just having a bad day, I guess. Uh, and uh, you know, so a lot of a lot of a lot of people answer their. You'd be shocked how many people answer their door nude. Really, you know, they just pull nude. up, open just the door. Don't care. Yeah, just you know, any any inhibitions they have have been lost on them years ago. Uh, but uh, but yeah, lots of crazy stuff like that happens. So Devin, how do you get over the mental block or mental mentally if you like? Maybe you go a stretch of like 50 doors and they're just kind of slamming in your face over and over. What do you do mentally to kind of recoup? change your paradigm. You got to get to a place where you're comfortable being uncomfortable yeah. and you've got to really understand is very much like in business. You know, I, you, it's like a roller coaster. You, 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 you're going to ride the highs and you're going to ride lows, but you yeah. have to figure out how to do is to steady your emotions. And it's a very physical, it's, it's very much a, decision to not let yourself um, get too high on the highs or get too low on the lows. You have to make yeah. a conscious decision to say, hey, 
I just had a win, but I know I got to get right back to work because I got to I got to produce for the next one. Right. And also, when you go for three days, not 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 fifty doors, three or four days, and not having your results, you know, hundreds of doors a day for three or four days at a time with no results can potentially be a little bit demoralizing. For sure, you got to get yourself to a place where you know you can win, and you just got to keep fighting to get that next win. So it's very much. Um, less tactic and more conscious decision to, to not get too high on the wins and not too low on yeah. the losses. Is there something you tell yourself at that point? Like after three days, like I know it, it took me last time a thousand and twenty six doors to knock on or what do you tell yourself mentally? Because that makes perfect sense. But when you're in the moment, it's tough. Like if you're in that low moment, it's tough to think, yeah. you know, think not emotionally about it. I'm wondering you know, if there's I, any things you... I, Actually, don't know any like specific tactic no. other than making sure you have you know an incentive, whether that be money or you know. For me, it's feeding kids. You know, I mean, right. I especially when when I started this business, I was very uncomfortable with what I was doing and the and the trust that I had and in in you know kind of the situation I was in, and I just knew I needed to. I had, I had quit college, so I couldn't just go put my resume in somewhere. So if I was going to feed my family, I had to do it hunting. So I just yeah. had to always be hunting. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I just um, – It's just I, do or die. Well, I think it goes back to, to being more of a workhorse than a show horse. Like there, there might be some special fancy things you can do to tell yourself or some quotes you can write down. But I think more than anything – just having some grit and, and bearing down and knowing yeah. that if you put in the time, you'll get the wins. When you have the win, you can't get too excited yeah. about it because you know you got to get right back to grinding again. So yeah. just really getting to where you can, you're comfortable being uncomfortable. Now all of a sudden, no's are normal. You know, wins are good, but you don't really experience these, these, yeah. these downtimes per se. Yeah. But I feel like in your head, it was in your head like, okay. Um, either I do this or, you know, I feed my kids and that, yeah, that's, yeah. That, that was in your head, you know, probably the yep. whole time is you had that something, it's like a pain motivator. Like if I don't do this, the kids aren't eating type of thing. It's, it's very much a stick and a carrot, right? I mean, you, you've, you've got the, I knew that what we were, especially once we started building first mile, you know, I knew we, I knew that what we were doing was not intuitive to the industry, meaning there was a lot of pushback in the way we wanted to build our model. It was it was really thought down upon, I guess you would say, being an asset-based provider. Everyone was about being a brokerage or being a non-asset-based provider. Mm -hmm. So what we were doing was, I think, kind of counterintuitive to what I guess the industry would have otherwise told mm -hmm. us. So it was fairly risky, but I knew that I knew that we could do something special if we executed. So that was kind of the carrot for me. But then the stick was, you know, you have to produce or you yeah. literally can't pay your rent next month. So, yeah. Um, yeah. you know. So the process is different with First Mile. Yes. Tell me about what that means. Well, we very much evolved. And what we were four years ago is different than what we are today. And hopefully what we are four years from now is, is also different from what we are today. Yeah. Um, what so did that's, you start off Yes. Well, uh, we started off first as uh, solving some some fairly significant pain points for our clients, uh, namely the cost of shipping increasing, um, and we found some ways and resources that potentially allowed clients to to find some some relief in in shipping costs. Uh, but the problem was is that these really good products, these really kind of commercial grade products that were available to the marketplace, were mostly only digestible by really big companies. Uh, that was due to limitations. Because of volume or what? Uh, that was one aspect of it, right? Mm -hmm. One volume, you're not really a needle mover for, you know, say a salesperson who's covering four states. Um, uh, also, there are some severe limitations in terms of, of pickups, picks up flexibility, but cost is significant on the front end of logistics. Um, and also technology. Technology is huge in terms of product availability. Uh you know, most people, maybe less so now, but but even four and five and six years ago, most people, they are really good at, hey, I, I figured out how to make these special belts or a very unique cell phone cover or these awesome T-shirts or special vitamins or whatever it is. They're really good at making a product. They are really good at selling it. 
Now all of a sudden they got to get it to their customers and you just call USPS, FedEx or UPS and that's like all you really know to do and you kind of get pigeonholed into being in, into a you're, you're limited in your options, not yeah. not because you're ignorant, but just because you, you, you just don't know yet because you're good at making a product and selling it, not at fulfilling or shipping right. it. It's and so we started, industry. Yeah. Yeah, and so you, we started figuring out how to um, build the technology that was a bridge between these really big, awesome products and networks to these small to medium-sized e-commerce companies and, and made them digestible, both from a technology perspective that had to be developed and an actual, like literally trucks that show up and pick up your packages every day. Um, and so um, it started by solving some some problems for our clients. Yeah. What should these people be doing? So like right now you're saying these small, medium-sized businesses are when they have products to ship out, they'll call UPS or FedEx. What's a better solution for them? What should they be doing? Well, probably the only option that should ever exist is just to call first model. I mean, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so the pain. Po- <laughs> so t- <laughs> I just threw you a softball on that one. <laughs> uh, no, you know what? It's, What's the big pain point though? Like they don't like some people. Do they see a pain point? Because like you said, they don't know anything it's, different. It's kind of, yeah, that's the thing. Is it's not. It's not something that they've done wrong per se, the, the best thing to do is get your product moving. I mean, ship it and make sure the, the important part is that you're, you're selling product, you're perfecting your craft and manufacturing and selling and finding the eyeballs. Um, but I think subsequent to that is not being shut off to alternatives, right? Like sales ha- kind of has this like bad connotation. You know, you get cold calls in your email, you get the guy showing up in your, in your front office, you know, and it is kind of can be a little bit of a nuisance and, and you know, you don't want to take the time, you're busy. But I think I think that's unwise. I think it's I think it's good good to understand what is out there and what your options are and, and not to be closed off because you've got to be able to evolve and you maybe don't have time to look into all these other things. So, you know, it, it's likely that maybe only five or ten percent of the stuff that comes out to you is gonna be worth your while. But if you're not open to it, you're not going to catch the 5 or 10% that could have a dramatic impact on your business. So I think not being shut off to options is so crucial, especially for new companies. Well, maybe even all companies. I mean, you, you can get kind of st- stagnant. So I think being open to change and looking and considering options is always really valuable for businesses. Um, but, uh, but once you, in terms of like mechanics of what, you know, there are a lot of really great products now and, and, and being eager and hungry to understand those things, you know, is very important. So the biggest obstacles the that, biggest obstacle that, that you face is someone's like, "Oh, well, I'm already doing it this way. I've done this way for years. I don't really need this type of service. Um, so what are the benefits? Like, obviously there's a cost benefit, right? There's a cost savings. What, um, why do people decide to go with first mile? Well, um, there are a number of reasons, and it depends on the not only the products that you sell, but the industry that you're in, the marketplaces you sell on, the type of websites you sell in, yeah. uh, where you're located, where your customers are located. But I think if you were to generalize things, I would say... Well, yeah, I mean, who's the ideal customer for First Mile? Is there like a certain industry or size that is best to 90, use you? 90% of our clients uh, are e-commerce. So we, are, we built our logistics network for e-commerce companies. Yeah. We have clients that ship as few as 50 or 100 packages a day, and we have clients that ship as many as tens of thousands a day. Yeah. So um, it's hard to say there's a specific size, though we do find that we are we create the most advantage for someone who is um, – we're not great for startups because um, we, we have some pretty significant front, front end loaded costs, meaning you know we've got to send sometimes a huge truck to your dock every day, and we've got a driver in there, and we've paying his health insurance and the fuel in the truck. So if we're showing up and picking up, you know, your first three packages that you sell every day for the first few months, that's, it's going to be, and it's not going to, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. In order to make it make sense for us, it will now not make sense for you because we'd have to charge you so much. Right. So where we find where we're most valuable for clients is kind of once they've got out of that startup phase, you know, they've, they've, they've found a product, they've found the eyeballs that want the product, they start selling it. You know, now they're consistently selling 50, 100, 200, 300 orders a day. Um, they've historically been using, say, like a, a, a 
USPS first class mail or, or a UPS like a Mail Innovations or a FedEx Smart Post, some kind of product like that. Um, and we then can come in and that's who's usually who we do a really good job for, uh, both first in, in terms of cost savings. I mean, I don't particularly like selling on price because if you win something on price, you're going to lose it on price. It's very simple, right? Um, so we've done a lot of unique things outside of cost, but, but having said that, we're not going to win your business if, if we cost you money. So price is a huge factor because we're, we're there to save you money. Um, mm -hmm. But we do that through a lot of different ways, um, and that's evolved over time how we do that. With As our density has grown and our capabilities have increased and our network has diversified, we've been able to increase the number of ways in which we can we can create a win for you. Yeah. Um, and and that's whether that just be a reduction in cost all the way up through now we're even doing same day delivery, next day delivery um, in, 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 in select markets. And as we grow and increase our density, that will change. And so, um, so, you know, small to medium sized companies, companies processing orders between yeah. I would say a hundred and thousands a day um, yeah. has kind of been our niche. So Devin, for that company that's doing thousands per day, Yes. How does it work? Do they come pick up the packages and then bring them to a local facility? I mean, I'm assuming because it's called First Mile, you kind of cover that ground so it's more cost effective and, and more convenient for them. Yeah. So, so in essence, First Mile is very much indicative of its name, right? Um, if, if you look at transportation in general, when you talk about a last mile provider, the best one by far is the post office. They have someone touching every door in America every day. I mean, nobody can do that. It's a really, really incredible and valuable asset that they have. They're the best in last mile delivery. Then you have a lot of companies that are really good at moving packages all over the country and sorting and getting packages downstream. Um, that's not particularly our expertise. Uh, what we're really good at is the front end in terms of uh, finding customers building technology that's that's unique for optimal routing and getting packages where they need to go based on time and transit and cost reduction and doing it in a way that is kind of seamless for customers. First Mile um, is a marriage of technology and assets, trucking right. assets. Right. Um, if you think about the best way probably to explain First Mile is if you know you can hire the world's best warehouse manager. And there are some really fantastic software applications, companies like ShipStation and ShipWorks. You know, these are, you know, ADSI, IABLE. You know, there's there were tens, now there's hundreds. Of, maybe there's even thousands. Now it's a really big industry. This multi-carrier, multi-channel, you know, software platform is is really a valuable thing. Uh, and the reason they're valuable is because they they consolidate all of your information from multiple channels into one place and they allow you to ship with multiple carriers out the back end without with staying staying inside of one single platform. But if you think about that, let's say I have a thousand packages a day. I've got the world's best warehouse manager running my warehouse. I have this incredible software that I bring my orders into. I can create a, a custom routing for every zip code in America. I can have five incredibly negotiated contracts to move my thousand packages a day. But now what happens? I got two dock doors and now I've got five trucks showing up at the exact same place every day. I now have five invoices coming every week. I have five different customer service departments to deal with. I have five different tracking websites to deal with. And so you have all this really innovation yeah. that's happened on the front end of that piece. But then once it a label's printed, you still have this really inefficient hmm. transportation leaving that warehouse, right? right. Uh, and so First Mile is, in essence, a solution to that problem. Um, in that we have last mile partners um, all over the country and all over the world, to be yeah. honest, um, that allow us to suck in that shipping request in a form that says, hey, I need this delivered in three to five days or five to seven days. Our system can then look at our delivery partners and say, who can hit that time and transit request? And there might be one or two or three partners that can do that. And then our system automatically chooses the least cost option and presents you that label. So you yeah. might still ship with five carriers at the end of the day, um, but you have one tracking website to look at. You have one cost center. You have one customer service team um, yeah. that is, uh, as, in terms of a plug for our customer service department, very proactive um, in terms of you know playing offense with our customer service. Yeah. Um, and um, and so that's that's the general idea of First Mile. Uh, we have 
some very, very valuable partners that we that, that are very important to us um, that we do a lot of business with, and we hope that that will last for a very long time. But but we but that is constantly evolving. Yeah, Devin, it seems like there's two big pieces here, which both seem difficult to me, um, which is the shipping logistics component and the technology component, because you had to build the whole technology around this, right? Oh, oh yeah, very much so. so we have which is tougher, do you think? Mm. They're both challenging, but they're both they're all powered by technology, to be honest. I mean, you've got the front end piece, which is, you know, a label server that works very much like, you know, I'm sure you've either heard of or worked with companies like uh, Shippo or, you know, uh, I think uh, Easy Post is another one that, that basically sells access to a label server. Yeah. Um, we have our own label server. In fact, we have one built, I don't know, six years ago. We just we don't we don't sell access to that label server. We created intelligence inside of that label server. Um, so you have an incredible piece of technology on that side. But then we also developed a technology on the back end transportation yeah. side that manages all of our trucks and our pickups and our daily pickups and now also our deliveries as we've grown. We now do deliveries ourselves in markets where we can say, hey, of these thousand packages, here's a subset that actually They're close by type of thing. Days. We're gonna have a car in that area tomorrow. Yeah. We'll look at ourselves for you. And it's interesting. And, and that's so, kind of what Uber is starting to do a little bit too, right? I mean, they're picking up passengers and now they're starting delivery. Because- yeah, they're wanting to get in this delivery space. You know, that's a very interesting thing. In fact, I've, I've actually reached out to Uber a couple of times because there's, this, there's a huge flaw in what they're wanting to do. And I, yeah. I don't, I'm, sh- I'm sure they know about it. Go ahead, shoot. Yeah. But, but we're kind of like a perfect fit for them. So, yeah, if you have anybody at Uber, have them give me a Why call. is that? Why is it a good well, fit? If you think about, you know, peer to peer, whether it's Uber, Dlive, you know, uh, Postmates, or you know, whoever it is, um, in a one-to-one ratio, they're an incredible fit, right? So, for example, if I need someone to grab my dry cleaning or pick up my food that's at the restaurant that doesn't have delivery capability, and I don't want to go get it, it's it's an incredible resource. You got some guy driving by says, "Hey, I'll grab that, bring it to your house. You know, give me you know three, four, five bucks." Yeah, you know, it's it's really an incredible thing. Um, but when you take this into e-commerce, you run into these massive challenges. One is that let's say you run a warehouse and you're shipping 3,000 orders a day, right? And of those 3,000 orders a day, you might have, I don't know, call it 87 or 97 packages that are going to be delivered within a footprint around your facility that day. Right, right. Um, the first challenge if I'm Uber or Dlib or whoever else it is, is coming to you and saying, hey, I need you to add this unique piece of software or I need you to customize your operations to identify those packages right. every day. There needs to be like a uh, smart intelligence behind it so you can identify what, what's going on. That's problem one. Yeah. Problem two is now you've got to know, okay, uh, I, I don't know how I'm going to absorb 47 minivans coming to the back of my shipping dock every day. <laughs> and I don't know how I'm going to put these 97 packages on these 47 minivans, and I don't even know which package goes in which minivan, um, and who shows up every day is potentially different any day, uh, every day anyhow. So yeah. you have this big disconnect between transitioning from a one-to-one, meaning I go pick up this thing and I deliver to that place, versus showing up every day to consume anywhere from 80 to you know 200 packages from a single point and then get them out on these vehicles, right? That's just, that's, those are just some of the challenges. Yeah. Then you've got issues like, you know, what kind of food is also in the car? So what's the, my product gonna smell like when it gets delivered? And all these other things that are, that are challenging from a security standpoint. So those can be solved more easily. The big problems is the technology and the pickup. That's why First Mile is unique. And that's why we're looking to maybe start partnering with some peer-to-peer groups because our clients are already using our technology. Our technology is already telling us what's staying in a local, uh, uh, within a certain footprint. Yeah. We are already routing those and sorting those for delivery every day. Yeah. And we have our own facilities where we're happy to bring on, you know, a hundred minivans a day and then get those packages out. So, um, in many cases, we put those onto our own vehicles and we deliver them now. Uh, but we very much so could scale with the ability to just partner with someone who does have the pickup capability that does not maybe necessarily have the e-commerce expertise or technology that's already 
sucking out that data and already routing those packages. Mm. That's that's what we already do. So, um, so someone like Uber may use your technology. Well, very much so. I mean, we're like we're like a plug on for them to say, hey, we want to get into e-commerce. Well, no big deal. We already know that packages can go on your cars. They're already using our technology. We already have a truck there picking up the two thousand packages. So a customer doesn't have to say, here's your 87 package. They say, here's all my packages. And our system knows how to suck those out and put them on the cars. Mm -hmm. This seems like a very capital intensive business. You probably need programmers. You need drivers. You need trucks. You need fuel. How did you bootstrap this? Uh, That was was the, when I was reading, um, doing research on you, you took no outside investment for this. Correct. Correct. So how did you do that? It's very hard. uh, it, in the in the early days, uh, we just the only option we had was to outsell growth. Meaning, uh, when I needed to hire my first employee, um, I knew that her hourly wage was X, which on average meant this many shipments, which on average meant this many customers. So I'd go get the customers, I'd get the shipments in, then I would have the margin, then I could hire the employee. Right. So we hired probably our first fifteen employees like that. We bought our first. At first, I was doing pickups in my Jeep. I had this 1994 Jeep Grand Cherokee um, with the bottom all rusted out. And uh, luckily, our clients trusted me enough. You know, I would I would do sales and admin stuff during the day. And about four o'clock, I'd get in the Jeep and I'd go do pickups. And then I'd go take stuff to the mail terminal. And I'd be in the mail terminal till two or three or four in the morning. You know, getting packages going. And, wow. and so um, that's how we started. And then once we had enough cash from margin in the bank to buy the first van, we bought the first van and. In the beginning, I didn't, you know, I didn't know if we were going to make it or not. So I, we would only buy vehicles with cash because if things went bad. I, I knew I could, could at least sell, sell trucks. I didn't yeah. have all this, debt, you know, the noose around my neck. And so, for the first few years, our only option was just to outsell growth. And so that's what we've done. Um, that's impressive. We're getting to a point now where that's getting a little more challenging, just because you know, going from four million dollars a year to 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 thirteen million dollars a year to twenty million dollars a year. You know, those are those are more um, – you can you can outpace those just through like kind of like hard work, you know. But going from say 60 to 150 to 250, I've not done that before. Um, but I know that it's – I know that we can't outsell it. So we, we just kind of have to either slow down a little bit or, or look at some financing options. But our business is not one that's – you know, we get probably – I don't know. I probably get three to five emails a week from like VC firms and those kind of guys, but they want to put money in. Yeah, they do. Well, they think they do, uh, but they're all <laughs> EBITDA to flip, right? And, and it's when you have a business that's high volume, small margin that has a lot of capex. That's that's not a great traditional win for a VC firm who just wants to you know look at a good chunk of EBITDA, figure out how to add a point or two to it, grow it for three years, and flip it. Um, you know, for us, we're much more strategic in nature in developing our network and growing our network. And so, you know, that makes it a little bit more challenging. Um, and those guys can, no offense, they can just be a huge black hole of energy. I mean, it, it can just it can just suck you dry in terms of resources. And, you know, you got to run the business day to day. And, and dealing with that, those conversations is almost a full time job in and of itself. And right. so we just haven't been real open to, you know, entertaining that stuff get beat up like that yeah. yeah so we're just trying to motor along as best we can bootstrapping it is it is very hard so at what point did you hire your first kind of developer person for the technology side because i mean um, in the beginning it was you selling delivering yeah. everything and obviously you weren't coding from like 3 a.m to 5 a.m and then no, not no, sleeping not so. at all, but one of the first yeah. things we saw was this huge need um for development and I mean this calls I, I don't want to bore you with the details of why but suffice it to say that we we needed this piece of technology and so I found someone that I could I could never have afforded like from a seller perspective so I would I would hire on contract in tranches and he worked on contract for us for about two years and then well about a year and a half and for a, probably 80% of that time I was trying to talk him into coming to work with us but right. he had a great you know, daytime job, very secure, big, stable company, you know, and here's this kid in this little office, you know, trying to get him over. And it's just like, no way he had a new, you know, he had a new wife. And so we were too risky. Uh, so we just kept on contract. And then eventually 
you know, we finally talked him into coming over full time. Mm. And um, since then, we've we've built out that technology. We've also outsourced two huge pieces of technology that 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 we own, but we've built through contract labor. So uh, we have a mix of both of in house you know, and contracted code that we've had to develop. Yeah, and then tell me about the expansion. What did the expansion look like? So obviously, if you. And then you're probably serving the local area because now you're in United Kingdom, Italy, Hong Kong. You're all over the place. Yeah. Where did well, that? Where did you first expand, and how did it go from there? So we have different functions in those areas. So the the core first mile functions, uh, you know, we we ship to I don't know two hundred something countries. So um, we also have customers in those countries. We also have uh, you know physical brick and mortar facilities. Um, mm -hmm like in Italy, for example, and then we have a technology base in Hong Kong. Um, and so we've, we've always just grown to the customer, meaning we've created new products when we felt a pain point or demand for it. And we've tried to build in a way that we knew could scale and have application for our other customers. Yeah. And so we've just always had to do it in a way that we could pay for it and then hope we could sell it and monetize it, you know, after the fact to our customer base. So what are some of the products? I know you have an annual sales conference coming up. So what are you going to talk about at the annual sales conference? Well, uh, lots of things. Everything from SOPs for implement implementation and setting up customers to, you know, how to, you know, provide the, the proper tariffs to clients so that, you know, we're not we're not starting off in the hole, you know, running a big 26 foot straight truck to a customer that gives us one bag of, you know, two ounce cell phone covers every day. So, you know, understanding how to run those SOPs, but from a product perspective, most of our training will be based around a new product called X parcel, which is, um, very, uh, I guess new, I guess I would say to the industry. And that's, that's our, that's the ship method, a first mile ship method. So X parcel. That, Yep, that tells us, hey, this customer, we have X parcel expedited, X parcel ground, X parcel same day. Um, that basically, what that tells us is, hey, this customer wants to ship expedited, or in other words, this customer needs it delivered in three to five days. X parcel is a ship method that runs this logic on the back end that says, hey, here's you're getting it from zip code A to zip code B. Here's you know four or five of our partners that can do that. Here's the one that's the least cost option and sends back the appropriate label, tracking number, cost of the shipment, wraps up that data, sends sends the manifest off to the appropriate induction point, yeah. and yeah. then uh, gets it routed onto the truck and into the right induction point and gets the package delivered. And so there's a lot of moving parts there. What faces the customer is hopefully very simple and clean, but what it takes to <laughs> All the, a lot of mice running in the background. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff there, right? And so. Uh, training our people on how to appropriately, you know, not, not only support it but sell it and and, and nurture it and develop it is uh, uh, it, it it's a very sensitive thing. So we'll be doing a lot of training on that. We just rolled out um, same day delivery. Um, we launched. We've been building the technology to do it for about two years. We wow. started a beta test about six months ago. That's gone really well. Uh, we did a beta test with one client, rolled that up to about four or five. Now I think we have a dozen or so um, out of hundreds, and so we'll slowly start turning those dials on. And uh, we're doing we're doing deliveries now in Salt Lake City. Yeah. We're procuring the vehicles. Uh, we have a fleet of Priuses, so yeah. we're we'll be putting a new fleet inside in Southern California, where actually our largest customer base is. Um, and then we'll be rolling out to Phoenix, Denver. We have a facility where uh, we have trucks running in New York City with a new facility coming in and, and also new deliveries coming there uh, probably by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of what we'll be doing a lot of training Interesting. On. So Devin, are companies like Amazon and Walmart, would they look at acquiring a company like you because of the capabilities you have of getting things out in a certain radius? You know, I think that... Or is that not in their, no, their realm I, I of thinking? No, I think that very much it, it potentially can be. You know, um, we don't really... I guess we don't spend a lot of time like looking for that per se, but um, but the functions or the mechanics of what we do have an incredible amount of application for those sorts of companies, um, just in terms of what our capabilities are. Um, but uh, you know, I don't know. We what we know is that uh, there there are a lot of needs not being met in the e-commerce logistics space. Right. But it's a huge space and it changes very fast and the technology is can be overwhelming. So 
um, we're consumed with trying to understand what do we need to do well two and right. three years from now yeah. because we need to start building now in order to have yeah. a perfect two years from now. What do you do? Because, I mean, like there's a day-to-day where you're servicing the customers and the current technology. Do you and your team kind of go away like into the foothills of your mountain home uh, every three months to, to write on a whiteboard to figure out where to go in two to three years? Or how do you plan wish, for that? I wish it was that organized. <laughs> Uh, um, you know, a lot of it's guess and check to be honest. Um, but keeping a pulse on the industry and understanding yeah. what's going on and hopefully our intuition is right. You know, I, we've, we've, we've made some bad bets, yeah. but most of them have been right on. Um, and so, you know, I think that, I think that we're on the right track. What's we something just- like that, Devin, that right now you made a right bet. Um, it wasn't so obvious when you first made it, but not, but it, it's obvious now that that was the right bet. Oh, uh, for us, probably by far the biggest one is building our own technology and buying, running the trucks for pickups because that, you know, especially five years ago, um, you know, because t- other companies outsource that they'll have the technology, but like, they'll have other trucks pick well, it up. Just like the traditional trucking companies. I mean, you have the actual guys that run the trucks. But maybe as big of an industry are the guys that sell space on those trucks, right? And so, you know, those brokerages are can be incredible profit centers and and you know, they're they're incredible businesses. Um that's just not what we are. That's just not what I was wanting to become. Um and so we didn't want to just particularly connect the dots per se. We wanted to actually contribute to the supply chain. I was seeing what companies like Shipworks and Ready Shipper and 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 ShipStation were contributing to the e-commerce environment, but nobody was making a, a a dent of difference in the actual logistics. Like, you know, orders came in from ten different places into one application. They were going out with four or five different carriers, but that was the end of the innovation, right? And so um, I just felt like there was an incredible amount of innovation there. Yeah. Uh, but it required technology and it required mm-hmm. trucking assets. There's a and, barrier to entry there. I mean, oh, huge. yeah, yeah, huge, yeah. Um, and so I think owning our own trucks, it, it would probably still be debated today. In fact, we still have debates about it. But um, me personally, it's probably one of the maybe the riskiest, but the best differentiation was was um, saying it's it's incredibly limiting because of the capex and 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 scaling. Um, but, but, you know, we have customers in over 40 states. And so experiencing a relationship with First Mile does not require a truck per se, um, but it does require us to get your packages picked up every day. So sometimes we still have to contract it and outsource it. But at our core and in our core, um, I guess, uh, territories, um, yeah. you do have a, 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 a uniformed First Mile driver in a, in a branded First Mile truck show up every day. And in some cases now you have a branded First Mile uh, truck and driver delivering your packages every day also. Yeah, that's cool. What other software and tools do you see e-commerce uh, companies using? Obviously, you know, there's the besides the first mile suite, what else? Just e-commerce in general, you mean that, only pertaining to logistics? Uh, no, in general, that you think is important that you see, because um, you have your finger on the pulse probably of, of all the things people are using in their business. Yeah, I wouldn't say all, but I mean, we definitely see a lot, you know, everything from applications like Channel Advisor or things that compete with Channel Advisor, you know, that's, that's, that's a really big feat to, you know, manage your listings and to get them uploaded and to, you know, keep the same images in this marketplace as in this one and this one and this one and this one and and keeping the pricing, you know, similar and description similar, you know, that's a, that's a full-time job just managing that in one channel, let alone 10, um, so, you know, we see a lot of innovation and a lot of companies leveraging the use of those sorts of technologies. What we deal with the most is on the WMS side of things, you know, uh, warehouse management, transportation management systems, you know, are, are big. We work with a lot of those types of companies. So that's what we interact with the most because we're on the back end of e-commerce right, versus right. The front selling side. But um, that's, I mean, that's like an established player, any up and coming players that you, people should look out for in the software e-commerce space? Yeah. Um, you know, not, not off the top of my head that mm-hmm. people wouldn't really be aware of. Um, but, uh, 
you know, there are, there are a lot of really good things. I think you just got to keep your eyes open and, and, and be willing to try new things or at least look into new things. You don't want to go invest, you know, days at a time into 10 different things. And now you've wasted 30, you know, a month of your life. Yeah. But you know, I, I don't think you can be closed off. And to be honest, you know, that's, that's where we've created a lot of opportunity is, you know, you think, you know, man, logistics has been around for ever. I mean, it's probably one of the world's oldest industries. How do you make a change in that? Um, but sometimes those create huge opportunities where it's kind of ripe for innovation. And as a company, we've had a huge advantage in that we've been very nimble and we could change and move very quickly. But it's also kind of a, it's, it's a challenge as we've grown to stay as nimble. And that's probably my biggest fear in terms of our go forward competitiveness is keeping our sales teams as hungry and as nimble and being able mm -hmm. to perform for the customers as quickly as we historically have. And at the same time, build in a way that's organized and that doesn't create chaos for the back end teams who have to manage mm -hmm. it all. And so, um, for me, that's a big fear is making sure we don't get so big that we become as slow as everybody else. Um, and so I'm, I hope we're still doing that well and I hope we will continue to do that well. But I think that applies in these other cases with other companies in that you've got to stay hungry for innovation. And a part of that is understanding what other options are out there to do things better. Yeah. If you just yeah. think that what works today will work forever, um, you will die. You know, yeah. you've, you've got to be able to evolve or you won't exist for very long. So, you know, Devin, obviously in the early days, you were hungry because you had to feed your kids, right? Yes. So how do you how do you keep your sales team hungry? Uh, money. <laughs> <laughs> they have kids to feed also. Uh, you know, that's, that's a little tongue in cheek. Obviously, that's a component to yeah. anyone's living. Um, but But I think what we're doing is very exciting. And I think that um, once people understand what we're doing, they, they appreciate that, man, this could really be something unique and special. So I think having our people invested in and bought in on what we're doing and, and the uniqueness of it is, is important. Um, and I think, I think that they're excited to be building something unique and exciting. Um, and I, and I hope that 10 years from now will be the same, the same way. I mean, if we had done things our second year in business, the way we had the first year, we would have died the second year. Yeah. And if we had done things the third year the way we did in the second year, we would have died. Yeah. So we've had to evolve every year and pivot and change every year. And I would estimate that's going to that's gonna be the same, the same every year going forward. Um, and so hopefully what that creates is excitement and change and keeps people hungry to keep growing and building. How do you find a good salesperson? Um, because I'm sure you're all you're always growing, you're always expanding, you're always probably looking for good yep. sales. I feel like everyone I talk to, any company, they're always looking for yeah. a good salesperson. So sales I'm curious is, of your process. Sales is kind of that's your engine, right? I mean, not only to grow, but it also seems to be a cure cure all for a lot of problems that yeah. plague businesses. And so it is, it's very challenging. Yeah. Um, I mean, do you get like a headhunter? Do you like search certain play? I mean, what do a you? A lot of companies have we haven't. Um, we, we kind of have a, have a hybrid sales model. We've, we've been fortunate to work with a lot of sales partners in the early days where, you know, I couldn't afford payroll for years. I mean, I, I couldn't, especially good salespeople. So for us, we worked with a lot of like contract salespeople or, or people that had kind of been in our industry or, or a similar industry that, that touched our customer base, but maybe didn't offer our products. And so we worked mm. with them on a contract basis for a lot. Once we, once we got a little bit bigger, we started hiring in-house salespeople. And we have some really fantastic in-house salespeople now, and so uh, a lot of it's been luck. We've we've had the, some that haven't worked out, and we've had some that have been fantastic. And so, um, and it's it's interesting. I'm trying to figure out the answer to that question myself because we've had some some people come in. You think you're going to hit a home run, and they just right. can't seem to. What is it? Yeah. Any guys come in that you just think aren't going to last a month, and they just hit a home run. And so I don't know. <laughs> You know, but I, I what's that magic sauce? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. When you find the answer, let me know. I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. So, Devin, this has been hugely valuable. So, I want to thank you so much. And I have one last question. Um, everyone, first of all, should check out firstmile.com. That's a great domain, by the way. Thank you. Did you have to acquire that from someone? Yes. Or you did. Yeah. We had to sit on it for a while because we couldn't afford it. And, and I couldn't stomach paying for it. And we, we, negotiated on it for 
a, a long time because our, our actual, our company name is International Fulfillment Solutions and we went, we go by the uh, acronym IFS a lot. Yeah. Uh, that didn't really, you know, when I was out selling customers and they were, they were trying to, it's hard enough to understand all this stuff going on and, you know, so I would kind of try and explain, look, the post office is a last mile delivery partner and we have partners that can route packages around the country and get it to the last mile. We're the exact opposite of the post office. We're the first mile. Mm. And you so just kept saying it. That's where the name came from. Yeah. yeah. And it stuck. And, yep. So yep. last question, Devin, because I know you're a busy man. You probably have to, I know you have to get on a flight tomorrow. You probably have to call Hong Kong. I don't know. But um, last question is, what's been, um, would you say, the lowest moment? And what would, be, what would you say has been one of the proudest moments in the business? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, Beside being chased off of the porch with a shotgun, that does not count yeah. for the lowest. Um, I would say probably by far the highest point is actually less, less having to do with, you know, I would say the wins we've had with customers per se, but, you know, um, and it's kind of a double-edged sword. When we were first growing, I knew every employee, I knew, you know, usually their spouses and their kids and, you know, some unique thing about their situation. Um, and oftentimes now I'll be in the kitchen or the break room or somewhere and someone will walk in wearing a first mile uniform or, you know, they're sitting in a cubicle and I'm not sure who they are or where they came from. Um, but to be able to realize that there's some family behind that person that's having, you know, they're being able to produce for themselves and have an environment that they are comfortable working in. That, that's probably the most fulfilling for providing me. for the staff um, and the families of the staff. Yeah, Knowing that we've created something that, that is self-sustaining in the, in the sense that, you know, People that can can come and work hard and do a good job can provide for themselves and their families and have a way to to increase in their livelihood and their their satisfaction and happiness level. Um, that's very satis that, that's very satisfying for me. So I would say that's probably the the high is when you have a situation like that. Mm -hmm. um, the low is you know the stress probably on you know family you know and and uh, you know it's challenging because you have three kids and one on the way. Yeah, 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 and, and that's exciting. Yeah, it is. It's just you know the business. There's no turn off or you don't. He doesn't turn on at eight and turn off at six. You know, so it's just kind of constantly there. So that can be wearing on your family when you just sometimes it's not. It's not one of those things where you know I see a lot of these like quotes or something you know online or LinkedIn like oh you gotta put more you, you gotta like you know spend more time or split your time or you know be a little bit more diversified in your things and. It's like, man, that just sounds great, but yeah. a lot of times they're just things that you just you have to do or you die. Like you just you don't have a choice. Well, your choice is do it or die. And so, um, yeah, that could be worrying. Maybe on, that's the quote you put on LinkedIn: "Do it or die." Do it or die. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, and so, yeah, you you don't you you don't have the luxury of just like not responding to that thing or yeah. dealing with that issue or you know addressing that concern. And so. Um, For sure. Yeah, that can be that can be challenging sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Devin, thank you so much. This has been awesome. Uh, everyone should check out firstmile.com. And then you guys will be at the Prosper Show uh, as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Come yeah. say hi. Uh, I'm sure we'll have great mints like everybody else. <laughs> Find some unique swag this year. That's, that's one of the biggest challenges, you know, getting swag that doesn't go in the garbage before <laughs> you get on the convention floor. Don't, yes. We'll have to brainstorm that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you again, Devin. Thanks, Absolute Jeremy. pleasure. Appreciate it. Have a good one. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.